And we're going to have a response to what our speakers just said, and we have a couple of folks who will be chatting with us. And let's begin with Gracie Lawson Borders, a professor at the UW Department of Communication and Journalism, and is jointly appointed as the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Her research focuses on media management, convergence, and new communication technologies. And Gracie, go ahead. All right, well, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Uh, good evening, and thank you for coming, and a special thank you to our speakers, Anne-Marie and uh, Rita and um, Jimmy. Um, what I'd like to say first is we took a little bit of a history lesson in technology and media in terms of we went back, and Anne-Marie told us to remember 1960 with the Kennedy-Nixon debate, when it changed the face of politics and how messages would be sent to us and what we expected in terms of the visualization of political campaigns. Um, it also made me think about something tonight. Um, in 2004, there was a lot of talk about that was the year of the blog and how everyone was blogging and what impact blogging was have. Then Jimmy brought back up to us that I guess we can now call 2012 the year of social media. Um, but in different kinds of ways. One of the things in some research I've been doing that was fascinating, in 2009, Facebook changed their mission statement. They first said their mission was to, to connect people. But then they went back and tweaked it and said, Facebook's mission is to give people the power to share and make the world more open and connected. Now exactly what they mean by that, they've not made clear, but 850 million um, users later around the globe, they are the number one leader, according to Pew Research Center, in social media. To get to a point, and I'm gonna skip around and do my summary this way, um, that uh, Rita made for us, is that social media is more than Facebook and Twitter. It is blogging, it is you know instant messaging. I mean, it just goes on and on. One of the very brief things I wanted to do was, I don't know if you recall um, Governor Ann Richards, since I spent a little time in Texas with Rita, so I can claim a little Texas like I claim Wyoming. And Governor Ann Richards made that lovely statement about uh, Jenya Rogers and Fred Astaire um, doing that lovely dancing together and how she did it so well, dancing not only backwards but in the high heels. Well, in the history of media, um, Newspapers come into our lives and then along comes radio and newspapers don't disappear. Along comes television and radio and newspapers do not disappear. Along comes cable and you get my point. Now we have social media and everybody's here and everybody's at the table. And so what we did is we heard from Jimmy, um, which I thought was quite a fascinating history trail to talk about how the technology was being used. And I will forever have that image of that first website, of the governor's website in terms of, it, it is, it was quite impressive because that's what we had, it was pretty static. And then we start to move forward of how you use the technology and the types of things and his experiences with the uh, different politicians he worked for and how they made use of it. And it seems pretty rudimentary, rudimentary right now, but it was, they were using the technology. It's a tool. And that's what I want to make sure before we leave the stage, we all remember, and all of you out there, that all of these are tools, and it's just how we choose to use them. Then we also heard um, from Rita talking to us how, and particularly in this 2012 election, how social media was used, particularly by the Obama, Obama campaign, to target people individually, give them voice, tell them you're participating. Now, how much you really are participating is a story to, to, to think about, but it reached out and said you could have a part in the conversation. And then Anne-Marie took us back and said, but let's remember there's all kinds of conversations. Uh, we've all been to the dinner parties or heard about the, I'll whisper in your ear and we'll see what the story will be by the time it gets to the end of the table. And usually we very much changed from how it started. Um, with social media to sit here as we all are doing tonight with our iPads and our phones so that we can be on Twitter gives us this instantaneous, this, this sense of gratification that we're having a conversation on a live and an instant basis. So I think what we can take away is there's a little bit of all of this going on and the question is what does it really mean? And I think that's what we're going to be continuing to have the conversation about. What does it really mean? How you use the technology? Who's using it? you know, um, the we television versus the me television, and then where do you go with it from here? Um, I don't think we've heard the end of this, but what will it mean in our day-to-day -day lives? Once we get past a major 
presidential election like this, we all have to get up in the morning and go to school or go to work or whatever we have to do for that day. And we have to, what's next? You know, um, how will we use it? How will we learn our lessons from it? So those are the things that I hope we get some questions about this evening. Thank you. One of the things that we often wonder, those of us in the media of Wyoming, is who's following us and who's discussing uh, different things that we report on, that we put out in social media. And you know, we wonder that all the time. Caitlin White actually asked a couple of questions about it. She earned her BA from the UW Department of Communication and Journalism and is now pursuing her master's degree in online journalism from the University of Memphis and uh, did some interesting research this year and got some answers for us. So go ahead. All right. Well, we did, um, along with Dr. Kristen Landerville of the Communication and Journalism Department, we did two, a kind of twofold research. Our first set was over the summer, and I traveled the state to do seven focus groups. Six of them were community-based focus groups, and one of them was a student focus group that we did here at the University of Wyoming. So I'll just kind of briefly summarize the results of that for you. Um, it was very interesting for us because we, we really wanted to see the differences between what older Wyoming resident voters and younger Wyoming resident voters have in comparison to their political connection and engagement, to how much they use new media to get political information. And from what we kind of discovered from those focus groups, it is very, very different. Um, the one thing I really wanted to note for you that kind of was consistent through all our focus groups was that for Wyoming residents, it does not seem like they're consistently accessing new media for political information. They more kind of run into the political information, you could say, on their social media accounts. So we would kind of say that Wyoming voters are not seekers of that political information, and they more just accidentally connect with it. Another thing that we really noticed across the board was that Wyoming residents, young or older, do not feel like they are politically connected or engaged on a local, state, or national level. And that was from the majority of our participants, which was kind of disconcerting. Um, we'd really like to feel like more people are engaged with the media, especially as journalists. Um, the reason, a couple reasons they said that they were not engaged the main one was because they do not trust the media. And that went for traditional media and new media. And they also said that they don't really have time to access new media, and it's a lot easier for them to usually turn on the television to find information. So that was just a brief summary of that study. Um, our other study concerned young voters and the 2012 presidential debates. And so during those debates, we had 340 voters come over to the classroom building, and we had them watch a debate up on a big screen. We streamed ABC, um, the channel of ABC. At our first debate, we had 71 participants. The second debate, we had 119. And the last debate, we had 150. So we had them complete a pre-survey and post-survey, and then watch the debate in between. And the results were very interesting. I'll briefly summarize those for you as well. Our average age was 19 and a half years old. So we had several very young voters, hmm. and obviously most of them would have been voting in a presidential election for the first time. So that was very interesting. Um, we also had an interesting demographic in terms of party breakdown. Um, we had 42% who said they were Republican, 27% said they were independent, 22% said they were Democrat, and 9% said they hadn't thought about it. We also kind of talked to them a little bit about how they were politically engaging during the election. And we did note that 24% of them had posted a political message to their social media. And then we also noted um, that that was 3.24, a mean of 3.24, which was slightly under the actual mean on a scale of one, not at all, to seven, absolutely. 45% of our participants use the internet most to get their information about the election, and 38% said that they went to social media as their primary place to go to look up political news. Another interesting thing, I know we were kind of talking about how now we can friend a presidential candidate. Um, on Facebook, 22% reported that they did friend a presidential candidate, which was a little over um, one out of five. And then on Twitter, we had 10% follow a presidential candidate, which was one out of 10. 
Um, the other things while I was listening to you guys speak that I really noted, um, Rita, when you were talking about undecided, the undecided voters, um, that really kind of struck me as a little bit funny after reading many of our comments. We had some open-ended questions. And one thing that we did have a person say was that they wrote in and asked who Mitt Romney was, and they said, who is she? So that was kind of different. Didn't realize that Mitt Romney was a presidential candidate or that he was a male. Um, so those were kind of, and then other things that we were talking about in the undecided voter area when they were speaking of when is the election, um, how do I know, you know, kind of who to vote for, those sorts of questions were things that people actually kind of wrote down. So that was, um, we were hoping, since most of our participants were actually from a political science class, that they'd kind of gain that information as they went through and kind of become <laughs> more um, knowledgeable voters as they went along. Um, the other thing was, um, I know we were talking a little bit about people who kind of are doing their own campaign now for a candidate. And the one thing that struck me is I'm a Pinterest user. I'm sure some of you out there are. Um, there was a lot of people who used Pinterest as a way to kind of sway other people. And the one that I was particularly thinking about is there was um, probably a woman in her 20s, and she was talking about how her job did not offer her health care, and she did it with screenshots of herself, and then she had signs as it went down, and explained she had no health care. Um, under her current insurance, nothing would be done about a tumor that she had in her brain, but because of Obamacare and a few other things, she was able to do that, and that's why she was voting for Obama again. And so it was very interesting just to see kind of how how many times it showed up on your Pinterest wall in and seeing how many more people were pinning it as time went on and it got closer to the election. The other thing I would mention about our presidential debate research is when we were talking about um, the binders full of women, that kind of one line phrase, there was kind of one for every debate. And we noticed that because there was one of those for every debate, our students seemed so much more engaged in what was actually happening on screen and being able to actually feel like they were kind of part of the presidential debate, I'd say. So the first one, you know, was Big Bird. And people were worried that Romney was going to cancel PBS. And so some funny comments we had, you know, were Big Bird, that's going to follow Romney forever. And then we did have um, one person say that they were worried that Romney was going to murder their beloved childhood dreams. So kind of overreactions, but still kind of funny, and that they were still engaging. Um, our second debate, which is the town hall debate, was again the binders full of women. And then there was also the line that said, um, my pension is bigger than yours. So they were very interested in those two comments. And then the third, it was the line about horses and bayonets. Um, and so we noticed that without Twitter, because we did do kind of a comparison, the room without Twitter was less engaged and we did have people kind of falling asleep or paying less attention, kind of wandering a little bit. So we found that while Twitter was very engaging, it was not educational, but it did help us to at least get people in the door and get them interested in learning about politics. We're going to take a couple of questions from the UW Political Science Club. And we also have a mic right here, so we've got, I think we have a couple we can play with as people ask questions. This is going to be Fred Lant, who is the club president, and he's got a few questions. Uh, the first one comes from Abby Fournier. She's a student at the College of Law from Cheyenne, Wyoming. Uh, her question is, how do you feel modern polit political satire, including The Daily Show and The Colbert Report, increased fragmentation biases and young voting demographics? So. I'll start. Alex, thank you. Thank you, uh, Abby. And Bob, I'm going to do a classic uh, political move. Okay. I'm going to answer my own question first. Okay. Now, let, me, let me just say, I As think, we've come to expect. I think <laughs> we're talking about two different things. I think that social media is different than big data. And I think that there's an intersection of social media and, and big data, but I think they're two entirely separate things. And so I don't look at 2012 being an election of, of social media. This was, a, this was a year of the propeller heads. When these guys are digging in and getting this amazing data, that's what changed the election. Social media, I looked at it as very, very much the Pinterest, Facebook, um, uh, Instagram, YouTube, blogging that you mentioned. Big data is entirely different. I think this was the year, this was the Moneyball election, and it had a lot of parallels with the movie and the book. So with that, then I will transfer over to the question about um, 
uh, uh, satire. I think the satire is awesome, and it's fun, and it connects with a certain audience. That audience eats it up. But you know what? It's really not, it's not that new. Saturday Night Live used to do the same thing, and they still do. But, and so it connects with a certain audience, and that audience likes it, and they dig it. But there's other audiences out there, too, that have their own, um, it's, an, it's an echo chamber, but, but they have their own people that they tune into, like the Rush Limbaugh's have their own crowd, and the Glenn Beck's have their own crowd, and the Drudge Report has his own crowd. And so I think it's fascinating, I think it's fun, uh, and there's obviously a market for it, and its impact, I don't know. I don't know if it's just an echo chamber, it's people hearing what they want to hear, it's that fragmentation. I don't know, but I can enjoy it. Well, I guess I have just a, a little different opinion, Jimmy, than you do about that, because I think for young people in particular, you have to have some political knowledge in order to understand what's going on on the satires. And so if there are phrases and things that are happening that you don't recognize, you have to go look that up somewhere. You have to figure out what it is or it's not even funny. So it does kind of create a social awareness of things. And then to pull the political move back, we wouldn't have that deep data mining if we hadn't been able to track it using social media. So the social media was the tool that allowed the data mining. So I'm kind of with you. I'm not sure that it's the social media. It's not being on Twitter, but it's what it allows you to track as a result of that. And the fact that people persuade people, not um, big mass campaigns the way we used to think in the hypodermic needle. Our next question uh, comes from Reed Lawler. He is uh, undeclared here, and he's from Laramie, Wyoming. He asks, are segments of the population left out of the social media surge? And if so, what impacts does this have on key election issues and voter behavior patterns? Uh, I, I think um, and the answer to that is yes. The answer to the first part of the question is yes. There are people left out of it, but not in an organized way. Um, anyone can elect to participate. I mean, that is... Um, that is the distinction between legacy media, you know, between newspapers or, you know, the networks um, or even the, you know, the major cable um, productions. Um, anyone can take a phone, open a Twitter account, and tweet away. Um, same with Facebook, same with, you know, with any of the things, or, you know, Pinterest accounts. All of that is available to everybody. Um, but you need access to the technology. Uh, it's cheaper than having access to a printing press. Um, you're more likely to be able to, you know, scrape up the money to buy uh, even a cheap smartphone than to, you know, have your own cable show um, or to have, uh, you know, a seat on the morning news on one of the networks. Uh, and I think what you've seen in a lot of um, developing countries um, we find this a lot with uh, emerging um, journalistic voices in parts of Africa, for instance, where they've kind of bypassed that traditional, uh, you know, the newspaper or television broadcast, and they're now communicating really via telephone. Um, and that tele telephone ownership uh, and access to telephone is, um, I think, really one of the major stories of this decade. Uh, and that was never true, ever, in our lifetimes, that kind of access to a powerful way to communicate across, you know, outside your own home. Um, you know, and so I, the second part of the question was, how is that shaping uh, the outcomes? And I think it's going to shape it in very, very dramatic ways. Um, you know, again, in the old days, you had to go knock on a door and get and have clips from the student newspaper to get hired to, you know, start as a young reporter and build your way up and maybe to cover City Hall and maybe to be an editor or a political columnist someday. Um, you look at somebody like Nate Silver, he didn't do it that way. And he was, I would argue, one of the most significant voices in this, um, in this campaign year. This is a guy who, out of the University of Chicago, you know, with not a lot of journalism experience, decided he cared a lot about stats and he cared a lot about baseball. 
And from that interest and an incredible amount of talent, he built a, a, a franchise that's now connected with Legacy Media, a very important newspaper, the New York Times. But really, he is his own brand. And I think that, that is a phenomenon that um, did not exist even a handful of years ago. I'll take a shot. I think that people will join a revolution of whatever kind it is. They'll join Facebook if they see a need for it. They'll join Twitter if they see a need for it. I see two different things. I live in, I live in West Hollywood. We had a, um, an earthquake about uh, three weeks ago. So, woke up in the middle of the night, my bed's moving. It's three options, okay? One is there's a burglar. Two, there's a possession. Three, it's an earthquake. I'm hoping, sadly there's only three, I'm hoping for option three, because I don't want to deal with one, I really don't want to deal with two. So what, what do I do to get my news? I go on Twitter. I want that, that's the first thing that I do. I want to find out, and I don't find, I found, I find out that there's a lot of other people like me going to Twitter to find out what's happening, but there's that sense of community. You find out right away, it was in Beverly Hills, it was a 3.3, no damage. But there was something about it that all these people are looking for it. Now, when I come out here, and I, uh, there was a, um, the early storm this year with the snows, I wanted to find out about that. And it was, it was a ghost town. I couldn't find people tweeting right. about that. And so is there that need? Well, if it will find itself if there is one. So are we missing out on much? You'll find it if you need it. And our final question uh, comes from Dorothy Davis. Uh, she's a business student here at the university and from Castle Rock, Colorado. Uh, this one also is more of a Wyoming question. So uh, a, a 2012 winner of a town council seat in Jackson, Wyoming, ran his campaign entirely paperless, using only social media and other electronic approaches. Will we see fewer yard signs, flyers, and brochures in the future, and will this allow for successful local races with fewer but more specialized resources? I do think we will. The yard signs are really expensive, and I think a lot of people don't really recognize that unless you've been in the, in the campaign trenches for a long time, and then people steal and they're, you know, they get hit by people trying to park their cars. Um, and it, it is very expensive to, to run those traditional kinds of media campaigns. I think there will always be a place for some of it. it. But what you're trying to do is to demonstrate momentum. You're trying to get people to talk to their neighbors and say, this is who I'm supporting, and, um, to draw conversations. I'm not sure that yard signs do that much anymore. Um, and so I, I, I'm not sure that that's going to be the way of it. Um, but it is a risky strategy to run right now an all social media campaign. It's, it's very difficult to do that because there's still a lot of people who are tactile and they want to have paper and they want to share information. I, I, I think we're not there yet, but I, I certainly could see a day when that would happen. I can't even get rid of paper in my office yet, so I'm still, still trying to get that done. Um, I, this year, uh, voted for the first time in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. I have, I, for you know, three decades I was voting in Chicago, um, the benefit being that you can vote twice, <laughs> as they say. Um, not true anymore, at least. Um, <laughs> but, uh, so for the very, so I'd been voting for years at, you know, at the Beulah Shoesmith School at the corner of Blanc and Blanc, and I could find my way there, find my way there blindfolded, and before that it was the Christopher Columbus School. Um, and so for the first time I was voting, you know, in a new place, and it, I had the name of the school, but I didn't exactly, it was, I had a hard time remembering it, and where was it? And I came home the night before the election, I came home from work, and um, that classic door-to-door -door paper experience I, was brought home to me, the value of it. I had stuck, uh, you know, uh, against my door a flyer that told me where my polling place was. It was, you know, put there by a specific party who also included the list of people they wanted me to vote for, but the utilitarian value of that piece of paper um, was really, it was really underscored for me in a powerful way that night. And then I was, uh, you know, the next day I was reading about, or election morning I was reading about how um, the Obama campaign had people that the night before and election morning still out in droves in Wisconsin doing the very same thing. 
because as highly technologically sophisticated as that campaign has pro you know, proved itself to be, they still did not, um, they still saw the value of that door-to-door, neighbor-to-neighbor, here's what you need to do tomorrow. Um, and I think to Rita's point, we are not at a paperless, we're not at the juncture that, that any, I, if I were a candidate running for anything, um, you know, except for queen of my household, which I've, you know. You've already won. Yes, my, <laughs> my family knows that. But if you're trying to communicate to anything larger than, you know, just kind of your block club, I think to, um, to do it through any single uh, form of communication is a bad idea. So just as I, on election night, was, you know, I mean, I had that day's paper, I had my Twitter account, and I had my Facebook, and I had the television in front of me, I still think for a long time to come, campaigns are gonna need to do the same thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention one thing. Um, I think that uh, retail politics isn't going anywhere. It's gonna take a long time if it ever does. The, um, the Twitter feed right now, I mean, it's a, it's a fire hydrant. Facebook, you got people that are posting whatever, and if they get too obnoxious, I'll block them. Uh, I get a thousand emails a day. So the, the best way that you can get a hold of, I tell people, if you really want to get a hold of me, fax me, because no one does that. <laughs> but that's on my desk, I'll see it. Um, so that, yeah, it's, it's, if, if you want to get, if you want to hit somebody over the head, you know, try ways that, people aren't doing anymore. Mail them something. Direct mail still works. Uh, we're not there yet, maybe at some point, but you still you just got to bash people. And, and I would say what was unique... Over maybe, the head. <clears throat> what I, I would say what was unique about this particular candidate, this was a journalist uh, who had written for the newspaper for a number of years and also was a magazine editor in some of the very social media inclined. It kind of backs up what you said before, that these people probably had a following before and, and were able to maybe capitalize on it, something like that. So um, thank you very much for those questions. Uh, we're going to take some of the audience questions now. And uh, here's one. What do you foresee as the possible use and impact of social media in not just elections, but in changing laws or writing new ones? <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, well, I think and Jimmy mentioned this earlier. When there's a need, I think that will it's a, a viable option. You know, what you're doing is basically trying to connect with other people. And um, the two people that sit to my left and right, I, I'm sure you all know Jimmy's reputation from, you know, the hometown boy made good. I mean, you you were one of the rock stars of NES, one of the rock stars, and and anybody in academics would study him, and, and certainly um, my colleague uh, to the right as well, and, and, and well deserves her Harvard appointment. And I, I say that because these are two people who seek out information, um, and they, they understand how to write in headlines, and they think in those terms. And I think Twitter is headline writing for the incompetent still. We haven't quite figured out how to make our arguments through headlines the way that newspapers and traditional media have, but I think that's what we're getting ready to do. So once we get the headlines right and people can join around those headlines, um, it's, it's like Reddit. We vote on the stories that we think are really the most important. So I can see it really changing a lot of things in the future as we begin to organize and, and let that voice be heard because, as Jimmy knows, when you work in campaigns, and, and certainly Senator Wallop knew that, um, you have to pay attention to the people at home and what they want if you want to stay in office. Why would it be different, though, than email? Because uh, candidates and people in office right now, they, they interact with constituents on email. Why would, would social media maybe be different? Faster, for one thing, and broader. Because with email, uh, it, I only send it to a person or whoever I have on my list. Even on Facebook, I have to be friends with them. Social media, like Twitter, with the hashtags, goes to a, a huge, broad spectrum of people who can um, join around ideas. Okay. Anybody else on that question? Let's go to the next one. This is for Anne Marie. Uh, speakers mostly talked about Twitter. It would be interesting to know what was the YouTube impact on election 2012. Oh, that's really that's a really good question too. Uh, um, I I we could talk about you could do a whole thing on the the use of video. Um, uh, by the campaigns and also um, by legacy news organizations. Um, and 
YouTube just being sort of one piece of that, but some of us were talking about earlier, um, you know, for those of us who made it up, stayed up through election night, but maybe didn't have that last, you know, gallon of gas to get us through the um, acceptance speeches, uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, the two speeches, the, uh, the speech by Governor Romney and the, the speech by um, President Obama, um, and that described me. I was exhausted. I went to sleep, but the first thing I needed to see in the morning were those two speeches. And, um, you know, you could find them on YouTube, or in my case, I went to my New York Times app on my iPad, and it's the first thing I pulled up out of the, you know, the drop-down video um, menu. And um, the other thing that YouTube, um, so and the campaigns were using it directly, uh, I think you saw, um, again, the Obama campaign was doing that four years ago, continued to do it, and uh, even after the election, one of the most popular um, pieces on YouTube, in YouTube history is the, 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 the short speech he made to his uh, Chicago campaign headquarters, uh, to his volunteers and his staff the day after the day after he won. It's a somewhat emotional speech. He talks about his own um, uh, organizing roots in Chicago, how they, he looks at them, sees that they are, you know, sees his, his, own, his own career in them and how much belief and faith he has in them, and then he, he starts to cry. This was a, a viral video. Um, if you went to YouTube and clicked on most viewed, most popular, highly, you know, there are those sort of buttons you can click at the bottom, that was showing up in all of them. So even after the campaign, um, and this is a man who's never gonna run again, he saw the value of speaking to his base and speaking to his audience um, because he's got a lot of work to do in the next four years. The other thing I would add is I think YouTube, um, there's a huge fun factor which um, you, know, you can't underestimate when you're trying to appeal to audiences. One of the things that was just a blast on YouTube this year was um, a group of clever kids who took the debate, took debate moments and turned them into musical, turned the, you know, songified um, uh, the debates. And I have to admit, I watched some of them more than once. Um, because they were, I saw every, you know, heard every word of the debate, and I just thought this was an artistic and funny and creative way to present it to a different sort of audience, and not unlike with John Stewart or Stephen Colbert does. No, it's not journalism. No, it's not reporting. Um, but it was politics as entertainment, and there is a huge entertainment factor, and I think YouTube really, the success of YouTube really plays to that. Okay. Uh, Jimmy, uh, what do you think will be the trend of the next election? Do you think mobile apps, applications, could play a crucial role? Oh, yeah. I mean, everything's going to mobile. Everything's mobile now. I mean, the, I mean we see it, uh, uh, we see it on, on our news site, and, and it's, uh, it's seen throughout the, the news industry. It's everything is going to mobile, and so the more that you can make your uh, your phone and your tablet or whatever uh, more responsive and um, easier to use and it, for it to have actual value, uh, the better. So I think that mobile is a place to go, but I mean, who knows after then? Uh, analytics will continue to be huge. Um, and I think that that's going, I mean, you're going to see an arms race in analytics because the Obama team had the superior team this time. They had these 54 people in something called the cave. And they were, um, you know, they were the nerds. It was a revenge of the nerds. And these guys did amazing stuff. And the, as you talked about, the, the models that they came out. So there's going to be a huge arms race in big data. And it'll be, it'll be even. Uh, it'll even out. Um, and then it'll go, things will go toward mobile. But then what's, what's after that? Have no clue. To add to what Jimmy says, the research I'm looking at with media organizations and how they are trying to restructure themselves and their business models, it is local, mobile, social. That's the Trinidad of which they all are talking about from the East Coast to the West. And that is because of how we're using this technology, this tool. And so they know they can't get around mobile because we all like the convenience of it, as you can see all of us up here trying to follow the Twitter of, at Wallet Fund. 
Um, they see it with people with their smartphones. As the CEO of AT&T said, I don't know why we call them phones, because they're more than phones. And one of the most important things that I tried to go back to um, Governor Ann Richards again in that lovely dance of Ginger Rogers in Fred Astaire, and that is every single new medium has had an intricate dance with the one before it and the one before that one, and they're all still here. Uh, follow up on something that Caitlin was talking about in her research. Are, are the rural populations and, and even the older folks, are they kind of out of the loop here? Are they going to be, are we going to see less of an impact from candidates and, and people in places like Wyoming or places where there, there might be a lot of older folks living? Can, can a candidate take advantage or will they lose out on that? Well, all right. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lag right now. Absolute lag. Uh, I use Twitter. I enjoy Twitter. A lot of times I don't have time for it, but I like it on, on, de on debate night. I, that was fun. It was almost as though the TV was a second screen right. because it was more fun to watch Twitter in action. Facebook got annoying, um, but that's probably because my friends are annoying. Um, <laughs> but I blocked a lot of them. Um, but there's a significant portion of the, there's a huge portion of the population that's not doing that. It's not paying attention to it. But more and more people are on Facebook now than ever before. I mean, it's, it's huge now. Twitter continues to grow. Instagram is insane. Uh, Pinterest, I don't understand, but my girlfriend does. Um, so there's all these different mediums, and there are people that are left out, but they'll find need for it. Or... They'll continue doing what they're doing, but it's, I, I don't feel like it's a, it's a, I don't feel there's a concern. I don't feel there's a need. They'll find it if they need to find it. What do you think? Well, the only thing I would add to that is that I do think geographically when you look at what happens, urban, suburban voters tend to use social media. And so, they, as, you, as you rightly point out, uh, rural areas are left out, and when you look at the campaign map, if you just look at geographic mm. territory, it certainly went to Romney in this election. So the, the, er, the, uh, the more rural sections of America were decidedly Republican, and, um, and I do think they feel left out. And they're certainly left out of social media as much as we're talking and driving to those points. But I don't think social media is the only tool of campaigns. So it, it may be the one we're talking about the most and the one that drove this particular election. But I still think uh, rural voters uh, pay attention to a lot of things, like, like all of us. What are the things that affect us and our lives? And they may be different than what happens in, um, in the cities, but, but they're still equally important. But they can participate if they want to. Yes. It's up to them. Right. Caitlin? Um, I was just going to kind of respond to what Jimmy just said about they um, can get to it. And in one of our focus groups, a concern was that um, a lot of Wyoming residents felt that there is a digital divide in Wyoming, meaning that we do have several residents still who are of voting age who are not able to access, um, they cannot afford cable, they um, will, do not have internet at their house, they cannot afford smartphones. So they're coming to you know, our public libraries to find this information. So in that way, they are seeking it out. But they are at a digital technology disadvantage. Um, one, because they do not have the money to access it. And two, when they can access it in a public free setting, they do not possess the understanding and the knowledge of the technology to actually do so. The other thing I was going to mention, um, our student um, focus group actually came up with the idea that a lot of Wyoming residents who are older, one reason that they do not choose to use new media is because of their profession. So they said that if you're more in a rural environment setting, so you're coal mining, oil drilling, ranching, you're less likely to use those things because it's just not part of your daily job. So maybe a smartphone or a computer or laptop, not part of your daily job, so you're less likely to access it and use it. So those were just two points from our focus groups. Maybe a last question for us, uh, and there, there's three or four of these kinds of questions. You can tell we have some people in the audience concerned about social media, and so you've talked about what's been going on with social media, some of the positive aspects of it. Uh, what's the downside? Well, I, I'm going to start 
and I'm sure we have a hundred things to mention, but the first one is privacy. The data mining that we were just talking about, um, it, it's deeply intrusive into people's lives and into their psychological profiles as much as their um, physical habits on a daily basis. I think we're going to see a, a lot of people really um, want to look at the issue of privacy, and we should. I think that's an excellent um, one, and um, uh, you know, and I did reference in my comments I, th this this notion that there are um, portions of the population being left out of this discussion, this conversation. A because they don't have access to the technology, or B they they don't know how to use it. Um, I was with an 80-year-old um, gentleman recently. He's got a phone. Um, he keeps it on him for emergencies, but he doesn't get tax, he doesn't know how to tax, he has the most basic plan, and this is somebody who's very politically engaged and interested, who reads the paper ravenously, but is left out of that other conversation. If it's not in television or not in his paper, he's not experiencing it. Um, and the other thing I would add is, um, and maybe, you know, I'm, you're the sort of the victim of the last story you read. I, I read a story today which was um, a version of something I'd read a couple of days ago, and there have been some um, really um, uh, good and troubling reporting uh, in the past week documenting um, some of the nastiest and uh, really, um, I would say, sort of frightening communications that were that existed around the the election and the campaigns. Um, uh, demonstrating extraordinary racism on the part of some um, users and some very aggressive views that none of us would um, accept as part of the debate in a civil society. Uh, these, it was not a political discussion, but just very mean-spirited, um, uh, really ugly, hateful kinds of comments. And there's been a lot of documentation of this um, in the past in the past week, and um, that's that, you know, one of the things that legacy media have always provided is that, that governor. Mm. Um, that was the role of the editor, right? Just because it's, just because you think it doesn't mean it belongs in the public discourse in that way. So, you know, one defense of that is, well, this is what people are thinking, at least we know. Um, I'm not so, um, I, I, I don't feel so good about that. And um, also that you have this generation of, you know, this young generation of, um, you know, kids uh, growing up with this. And anyone who's been a teenager or lives with a teenager uh, knows that there's a gap at a certain age between understanding that, you know, understanding an action and understanding the consequence to that. So I do worry about a generation growing up without that. And maybe this goes back to the privacy question where there is no governor, that they think it and it's immediately recorded and, and it stays there for all time. Um, and I, I think that's going to have um, a potentially damaging effect, negative effect on, on some of these kids, but also just the, the larger issue being the quality of public discourse in a democracy. As we tell our young journalists, you are on the air when you're tweeting, so yes. Uh, but, but I would say this. Uh, the privacy concerns are valid, uh, and I get those. You know, you can read about the cyberbullying, for example, which is horrific. But I will say this, on the poor behavior that you were talking about, what you want to do is you want to shine a light on it. You don't want to cover it up. And I think a great example of that was that bus driver that was bullied in the, in the Northeast. Uh, it was the Northeast, wasn't it? I can't remember where it was, but yeah, it was up in, in the Northeast, and so this woman was bullied by these adolescent kids, and it was a horrible video to watch. But then the good side of the internet came out, and they said, let's send this woman on a vacation. She deserves it. Look at this horrible video. Let's send her on a vacation. And, and so the internet community, of which I was, I gave her 25 bucks. They raised more than $700,000 for this woman, and she resigned, and it's great. <laughs> Now she's, she's not working anymore. So, so I, I would too. A more power to her. So I think that what you want to do is you want to shine a light on that stuff rather than I, uh, I worry about being the governor. I think the more that people know, the better. 
Well, thank you very much to all of our guests for coming, and thanks to all of you for showing up. And by the way, if you want to interact with any of them, they're delighted to tweet with you, and you can find them. If you have your program right in the bottom, they have everybody's uh, Twitter handle. You can also talk to me with the very popular Twitter handle of at ButterBob. So go ahead and, and look that up as well. And uh, you can also contact the Wallop Fund as well. Thanks to them for, of course, bringing us here. And thanks to all of you for coming. And good night.